So this is a technique that I don't think you've ever seen before, because I've never seen it before. Uh, we're getting delivery of fish. I'm gonna step back, because these are splashing. The way to get them out of the truck, because these, these buckets are so heavy, seems to be they put a tire on the ground, and, oh God. Welcome to Klong Doi Market, the culinary center of Bangkok and one of the largest wet markets on the entire planet. It's a nonstop machine, taking in the bounty of Thailand and sending meats, seafood, and produce to every corner of the capital, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. In the heart of one of the world's culinary powers, well, this is the engine that keeps it all in motion. And we're here for all of it. We're spending an entire day and night inside the market to try to understand how it works. The ingredients, the culture, and the people who keep this city eating. It's a full 24 hours inside one of the world's most fascinating markets. Today on OTR. When you enter Klong Doi Market from the Rama 4 Highway, the very first thing right at the entrance is the live poultry section. As an introduction, it's off the charts. A punch right to the nostrils and a middle finger to any kind of Western sensibility. Up next is a bridge across an old canal full of market waste separating Klong Doi from urban Bangkok like some kind of toxic medieval moat. This almost feels like a test, something meant to weed out those who came searching for processed meats and sterilized vegetables. Be warned, this is not for you. But for the rest of us, well, welcome inside one of the greatest celebrations of food the world has ever seen. So the first thing that comes to mind when you come to a, to a market like Klong Doi, even for me, who spent my life as a chef going to wet markets, is complete sensory overload. And I am, uh, I'm in the way. Uh, it's gonna be really, really hard not to be in the way as this is like commerce going on all around. We got guys pushing carts coming through. We got motorcycles driving right through these narrow alleys here in the market. This is Klong Doi. It's Thailand's biggest wet market. It's probably my favorite place in the city. Yeah, so this is gonna be a really interesting next 24 hours uh, and let's start exploring. It's hard to put the scale of Klong Doi into perspective. It's huge, it's a massive place. There are no official measurements in the actual size waxes and wanes as carts set up and tear down throughout the day, but the best guess is it's around 150,000 square meters, the size of about 30 football fields that happen to be packed with some of the world's best food. Here you'll find Thailand, fruits and vegetables, meats and seafood, dry goods, regional delicacies, and mountains of curry paste, all of it soon to be made into iconic dishes at restaurants across the city. Thai cuisine can feel like a mystery, something ancient and fascinating and packed with incredible flavors and world-famous specialties and thousands of years of history. But visiting the local wet market, it's there, out in the open, the secret to being a chef is that it's not magic, no matter what we want you, the customer, to believe. It's a math equation. Add the right ingredients in the right order with a little bit of technique and you can recreate literally anything. And when it comes to Thai food, well, all those ingredients can be found at Klong Toy Market. It's here where chefs come to buy the stuff that they know how to combine into magic. As just one example, there's an Isan restaurant not far from here where we filmed last year. Isan food is the Thai regional cuisine related to the culture of Lao, famous for big flavors, grilled meats, and somtan. And we chose that street cart for filming because it's one of the very best. And no sooner had we arrived in the market this morning than we bumped into the owner's mother, Wan Di, making her daily rounds to get ready for service just like she has for the last 50 years. 
Dish, what is she getting today? Oh, papaya. There is banana, pumpkin, banana. Then they also sang tam suat tam apa lah yang ni. They sell tam tam. Come on, go. Come to see. There is some vegetables, some vegetables, some vegetables, some vegetables. There are many things. Tam tam, pumpkin, banana, tam suat, tam tua. Believe it or not, even in a place this big and overwhelming, running into someone we know almost immediately is pretty much to be expected. This is more than a market; it's a center of Bangkok's community, a place where third-generation vendors sell to third-generation customers, and somehow, even at this scale, everyone seems to know each other. Today, places like Klongdoi are unique, the last of a dying culture. Only found today in a fast shrinking part of the world, but the wet market as a center of cuisine is something with a long and very important history all across the planet. The first place where fresh goods were sold at one central location, at least as far as we can guess from archaeology, was in ancient Egypt, where a food trading hub flourished on the banks of the Nile for 500 years before construction even began on the Great Pyramid of Giza. It was along the Nile where we first see markets start to form, places where farmers would bring produce like cucumbers, dates, peas, and figs, along with staple grains and dried fish. And those first markets didn't just allow cities to grow and expand, even without immediate access to farmland. They also gave rise to new kinds of businesses, like, for example, breweries. With the first in Egypt appearing in the city of Abydos around 3,000 BC, right next to one of those first markets, which happened to sell wheat and barley. Now, I have no idea whether the concept of this kind of market spread from Egypt or simply evolved on its own in multiple places around the same time. But either way, it wouldn't take long before food trading centers could be found almost wherever there were people. The first big step that took the ancient farmers' market and started down the path towards modernization, well, that comes around 500 BC, right at the beginning of the powerful Persian Empire. As Cyrus the Great came to power and Pasargadae grew into a thriving city, vendors would arrive on camelback and set out their goods along the roads: onions, chickpeas, rhubarb, and dried spices. So Cyrus, as he implemented a series of revolutionary laws and policies, enacted an ordinance regulating markets to certain defined spaces. The very first zoning laws, which created officially sanctioned markets that would become known as bazaars. From Persia, the planned construction of markets would spread to the Middle East, where they'd take on the Arabic name souk, and eventually to ancient Greece. Where we see the next step in the historical progression, with their markets or agoras strategically placed in the areas of highest foot traffic, vendors targeting customers as they left popular places like theaters or sporting arenas. These markets would become not just functional, but centers for community. For socialization and gossip, and as this concept moved east along the newly established Silk Road, it would be the Chinese around the 7th century A.D. who would introduce two more components that would forever change market culture. First, it was in China where farmers and traders started sharing space with cooked food vendors, street food stalls selling snacks and prepared meals for those too busy to cook for themselves. And second, with the popularity of these mixed-use markets, we find in Xi'an the first markets to stay open 24 hours a day, just like Klongdoi. Anyway, there's a lot more to this story, but first, it's time to start exploring the market. This is like the Thailand stall. You, you'll see these again all over the market. Lemongrass. Uh, we have galangal, kaffir lime. We have dill. Uh, we have the lime leaves and the limes themselves. This is finger root. 
uh, which is a really fun ingredient to play with. We have tamarind, and you see here we even have the lemongrass, kaffir, lime, and galangal, the holy trinity of tom yum, as uh, Palin's Kitchen would call it, um, all rubber banded together, just grab it and go. Um, yeah, all right, cool. When you arrive in a new place and you want to figure out where you are, take a crash course in the real city, you go to the nearest wet market. But when you're a chef, it's not optional. It's not just something you want to see when you travel, it's the reason you go in the first place. This is Tay Duke Ngo, better known as Chef Duke. He's a legend in the Berlin restaurant scene and is often referred to as Europe's best Asian chef. And he's just arrived in Bangkok for the first time in 20 years. Chef Duke is originally from Hanoi, born into a Vietnamese Cantonese family. And along with those two cuisines, his specialty is Japanese. As beginning in the 1990s, he spent years earning his stripes as a sushi master. Of the 19 restaurants Chef has opened, from Berlin to Frankfurt to Saint-Tropez, he's won multiple accolades in the Michelin Guide, been included in a list of the world's 50 best chefs, and named Berlin's top culinary innovator. And this is his first time at Klong Doi Market. to be fast because we keep getting pushed out of the way. Yeah. Chef? So busy. Uh, hi. So glad you could make it. Nice to see you. Nice to see this you. is not our first time meeting. We had lunch together a couple of days ago. Yes, two days ago. It was amazing. I'm sure as somebody who has been a career chef, but also, you know, your specialty is Japanese, Vietnamese, French, all these different styles of food that you What's the first thing you do when you go to a new place? You go to the wet market. You yes. find out what are the ingredients, what are people buying. Right. To me, you want to understand a culture, you go to the wet market. It, totally right. Uh, I'm always heading first to markets or to Chinatowns, to the market, that I can see what the ordinary people are eating. Then I take from that a lot of inspirations. Bamboos, I love bamboos, all this, this one. Making salad with that. How, so far from what you've seen, and we've been in the market for 10 seconds, how available is this in Europe? A lot of the, the produce that you're seeing. You can get most things by now, I would yeah. guess. By now you can get, I would say like 30% of what you see here. Okay. You can get in Germany, but not on this quality, of course. Thirty percent is not a big number. I would have expected higher. I, I would say from this stand, I would get okay only the tomatoes, mm. maybe some of these herbs, yeah. the mango. That's it. This one will be always deep frozen. Okay, of course. So, and all this stuff we don't get, but from this stand. Maybe more. Can you identify this ingredient? This is seasonal. This is just this month that this is sold here. Oh, these are lard? No. You're, you're, yeah, you're on the right track. Lard, red? The, yeah, so it's red ant eggs. There are certain ingredients that tell you where you are. Like if somehow you were dropped into a random wet market, if you know cuisine, you could get your bearings just by looking at what's on the tables. In Chef Duke's home city of Hanoi, it would be stuff like mint, sawtooth coriander, fish sauce, and lots and lots of Vietnamese sausages. In Sichuan province, where I learned to cook, you'll see peanuts, sesame, dried chilies, and of course, Sichuan peppers or hua jiao. And here it's the endemic staples of Thailand, coconut, bird's eye chilies, curry paste, and produce ranging from mangoes to long beans to so much more. Seen five five percent of the market altogether, but your your first reactions? Uh, it's it's overwhelming. It's really 
overwhelming and I really want to jump into it <laughs> and take it all home. A few months ago on the channel, we did a video about a bean called the sata, or the stink bean. We chose that subject for a video because it absolutely blew my mind that after 15 years as a chef, after traveling around much of the world, I could still find ingredients I hadn't known existed. The amazing thing about wet markets, not grocery stores, but places like this, is that when you're lucky enough to find yourself in a city that has one, you might see things, not mass market stuff, but random local ingredients that'll take your palate somewhere it's never been. And for someone who spends their career in this industry, I mean, why else would you do it? As a chef, I would get frustrated, as I'm sure you do. And when I say frustrated, I mean violently angry <laughs> when something that I put on my menu all of a sudden would be not available. My vendor would have something and I would put it on the menu and then all of a sudden it's out of stock. And that's something that is frustrating. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you know, when all of your life is with this consistency of what the grocery store is going to be carrying, mm -hmm. you know, what the Harris Teeter or the Kroger food line is going to have, right? Mm -hmm. Tesco, you know, and you know, and it's predictable and you can build your menu around it. You know, there is still something that I think is the difference between being a chef and being a cook of coming to a market like this and walking through it not knowing what you're going to find and seeing something that maybe just came off the truck for the first time that season being like, I want to build a dish around that. Right. You know, I love this kind of thing where it's unpredictable, right. where you don't have that. You don't know what you're going to find. And it's, if we come back in a month, 10% of these ingredients are going to be turned over to something completely different, right? right? And it's like that all year round. And that to me is sort of the fun of cooking. If you can't enjoy that as a chef, what are you doing, right? right. You are totally right, and I was always thinking about this subject, like being a real cook, like to have the challenge what you get every day and how many, and then you can you sell it to the people that they are still happy that you're coming back. That's the challenge in the Western world. Here is different. Here is like vendors have, like, or little restaurants have like an amount of fish balls, soups, what they serve like from nine in the morning to 11 and then it's sold out. Right. And they, they are just making a break. They start again tomorrow because they don't do more. But in the Western world, we are used to be, used to have like everything and every time. That's actually a bad thing to have. That makes the world and environment maybe, yeah. It's because the demand is so high. After a while, when I put it on the menu, everybody wants to eat a filet. Yeah, there's no fill anymore and you have to grow them faster and so it continues to be like in a very bad uh, thing for the world. Or, you know, you're, you want strawberries in December yeah, right. and you've got to put it on a container ship and send it across the ocean. Number one, it's not fresh. Number two, as you said, you're burning, burning fuel, you know, you're, right. you're, there is like, to me, it's, it's, it, it is something that I think we all have the responsibility to understand seasonality and ingredients, right? Never mind the fact that you're going to eat better when you understand seasonality. Totally. You are, you are, the people here in Southeast Asia, they eat better than us in the Western world. Because here it's all fresh and seasonal from the farmers outside of the cities. And then we in, in Western society, we have to go to the supermarket and get stuff from like 10,000 kilometers away. And um, we pay a lot of money for that. And it's that's what makes me angry sometimes when I'm here. I think, oh, these people live from $100 uh, a month, but they still eat better than us. โกโก้โอเวนตินกาแฟอะไรเงี้ยโอเลี้ยงครับก็มีเมนูทั่วไปครับชาไทยชาอะไรครับชาไทยชาเขียวอ๋แม่มาตีสี่ขายถึงเที่ยงตีสี่ถึงเที่ยงเราซื้ออย่างดีมาเราซื้ออย่างตัวมาแล้วเรามาชำระเองแล้วไม่ได้ซื้ออย่างเขาชำระมาแล้วเราซื้ออย่างเป็นตัวมา
ซึ่งอย่างตัวเป็นๆแล้วก็เขาก็เชือดแล้วก็ส่งมาให้เราก็ลงมาเก้ามองเช้าเป็นตามมองแล้วก็เลิกเต็มสุดก็สามวันก็รีวิวมังวันก็ไม่มีมันมีแต่ทาไปตามเรามา There are tens of thousands of people who work at Klong Doi Market. The vendors, sellers, butchers, packers, delivery drivers, security guards, and maintenance staff are the people who don't just power this one place. They literally make the city's legendary food scene possible. It's a hard job. Beyond the long hours, it's physically taxing, and when the summer monsoons arrive, the workers are still here, rain or shine, making sure Bangkok's restaurants get the products they need to stay in business. Many of the workers live within the market or in the dormitories right outside, and since almost nobody's on a salary and their pay comes from the work, many of the people who rely on the market for an income never take a single day off. In the chaos of the morning rush, it's hard to pay attention to the parallel market, the one meant for the workers who live here. But around lunchtime, there's a shift in the balance. For at least a short time, there are no restaurant clients. Everyone's got their orders for lunch, and nobody needs to restock yet. Everyday customers are on their own lunch breaks or staying out of the sun at the hottest time of the day, and that means we get a look behind the curtain. There's another world hidden between the food stalls. Inside the heart of Klong Doi, there are hair salons, cell phone shops, clothing stores, and even a dentist and a medical clinic. And that doesn't include the dozens of places to eat meant for the market workers, places that fill up in the 12 o'clock hour. There are people who live their entire life within these few blocks, and for some, well, that's all they've ever known. They were born here, raised here, and this is actually home. As it's been for the families who settled this land before the market was constructed. Basically, the story goes that before 1947, this was all empty real estate. So, with post World War II funding from the World Bank, work was completed on a container port, the first of its kind in the kingdom. The new facility, officially called Bangkok Port but unofficially known as Klong Doi, would open Thailand's agriculture and factories to the world and handle as much as 98% of the country's imports. It would need workers, lots of them, and so the king issued a proclamation that the empty land outside the harbor could be settled by any migrants who came to work the docks. Tens of thousands arrived, and by 1948, this area was the home of a makeshift community. A true melting pot of able-bodied men and women and their families from Isan, southern Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and Myanmar. The idea for a large-scale market came within the first years of the opening of Klong Doi Port. Part of the purpose was to service the port staff. I mean, this migrant district was quickly becoming the most densely populated part of the entire city. But it was more than that. It was also a chance to change the way food was sold. Until the 1950s, Bangkok still functioned as it had for two centuries. There was the city, and on the outskirts were the farms. In between is where you'd find the markets. If you wanted fruits and vegetables, you waited for the boats to arrive at your canal every week or two, or you went north to the trading hubs near Nantaburi. For rice, the markets were in the east, selling goods from Cha Chong Sao, and for seafood, you'd travel south to Samut Prakan. But Klong Doi Port saw boats arriving every hour from the farthest reaches of Thailand, from the neighboring countries and the home regions of so many of Bangkok's residents. So a market here could be something different, a place where everything from everywhere could come in fresh, with the added bonus of selling ingredients that local people wanted and until that point couldn't get. It's not a coincidence that the first Isan restaurants in Bangkok opened in the 1950s. That that decade also sees the first local Southern Thai places, the first Khao Gang counter selling a vast array of regional dishes, and the explosion of what we now call modern Thai cuisine. It all started here because of Klong Doi Market.
For a visitor to a coastal country like Thailand, one of the most fascinating parts of going to a wet market is the stuff that came from the water. Here with a heavy emphasis on three ingredients essential to Bangkok cuisine. There's Thai mackerel, sold fresh and dried. Clown featherback fish, minced and packaged along with long beans and basil for use in the ubiquitous fish cakes. And of course, river shrimp, straight from the Chao Praia the foundation of local cooking since the first settlements in this region, the kind of stuff sold long before the city became a modern melting pot.แล้วเราก็มาลงที่นี่เสร็จแล้วเราก็ต้องจัดแผงแล้วก็เอากุ้งขึ้นมาเราต้องคัดไซส์บางเจ้าเค้าไม่คัดไซส์แต่เราต้
because honestly, it doesn't get much more exciting than this. Okay, so I've assembled my plate. Uh, this is super cool, like this sort of airplane hangar sized space that's being turned into a Burmese cultural center. Um, you know, I named it that, they're not calling it that, but two hair salons, a nail salon, a couple of restaurants and a bar, and it's all intended for the workers here at the market. Um, we have a Burmese uh, vegetable stew, this amazing chicken curry, uh, which as you can see, I've, I've dove into already. I'm gonna get myself a little bit more. Uh, we have the lepetok, our favorite uh, fermented tea leaf salad, uh, the nanjitok, which is uh, thick rice noodles in a chicken curry, uh, which we added some chili, some lime, uh, and some shallot. And if that sounds like what you would do to a khao soy, there's a reason. They're all kind of from that similar uh, amazing part of the world. Uh, we have the vegetables to be dipped into the types of fermented fish paste, uh, and then we have some crispy fish. Uh, so this is our lunch. And uh, what a cool find this is at the market. It's also cool and outside is really hot. Uh, so we're gonna sit and just enjoy this. All right, after an afternoon snack and before Klongdoi gets busy again, we need to pick up our story of how places like this came to be. We left off with markets having grown into community centers with help from the Egyptians, Persians, Greeks, and Chinese. So let's jump ahead to the 14th century in Europe, which is at the end of a massive boom in population that saw the western part of the continent more than double over a period of 300 years. While this expansion was made possible by the souks, agoras, and bazaars that remained the center of society, the density of these new cities led to demand for easy access, not to just vegetables, but dry goods, staple grains, and non-perishable items. In Europe, starting in the 1300s, these necessities would be consolidated and sold at shops given the name grocers, or grossier, derived from Latin grossarius, meaning wholesale or a vendor who sells items in bulk. It's the same root as the word gross, as in gross product or revenue. Now these groceries, as they were, didn't take off immediately, and that's mainly because the same conditions that led to their development also created the overcrowding that in 1346 brought on the bubonic plague, which would cut that European population almost in half in the span of seven years. It took until the age of colonization in the 16th century for dry goods stores to open around the world, and they'd especially become a feature in the new American colonies. In the Americas, it would be common for a town grocer, not a produce market, to serve as the central part of new settlements, with traditional markets a weekly or bi-weekly occurrence selling vegetables from farms and fresh fish from the Atlantic. As the Western world industrialized beginning around the year 1760, jobs and stores became specialized, and dry goods grocers were soon joined along downtown main streets by bricks and mortar shops that sold specific products, green grocers selling vegetables, butcher shops portioning meat, and bakeries with fresh baked breads. In 1906, Upton Sinclair published his famous book, The Jungle, detailing conditions in meatpacking plants in Chicago, which caused a public outcry and forced passage of the world's first labeling laws, food safety regulations that essentially ended the American version of farm-to-blanket wet markets. The first businesses that combined the inventories of specialized shops and outdoor markets were simple counters in front of large warehouses, where customers would order at a counter and wait for the shopkeeper to assemble their goods. And then in 1916, we see the first self-service supermarket, called of all things the Piggly Wiggly in Memphis, Tennessee. Supermarkets would become a feature in the United States to comply with government regulations, but their spread around the world was not instantaneous. Market culture was obviously ingrained throughout the East and the Global South. 
The first Western-style big-box grocery store in Southeast Asia opened in Vietnam as recently as 1967, and in Thailand in 1972, a place called Foodland, around four kilometers to the northwest of Klongdoit. For Bangkok's urban elite and the growing foreign population, Foodland and the many other grocery stores that would follow would provide a haven for imported products and packaged ingredients. But with a much higher price point, the city's working class, along with the thousands upon thousands of restaurants and street carts that defined this city, would continue to rely on Klongdoi, a divide that still continues to the present, and for both the city's cooks and the market vendors, an existential battle to maintain a way of life. <laughs> อย่างที่เห็นน่ะเมื่อเกิดเทศตัวลังเตาแครอทมันฝรั่งผักกาดแก้วพริกยักษ์สามสีราชินีบรอกโกลีดอกคะน้าเห็ดเข็มทองเห
and the market has changed. You know, all of this, this is the main alley. This is where we started our shoot. Uh, this was fruit and vegetable vendors. Now it's street food all around. The whole neighborhood has, uh, has come out and descended on the market for their evening meal. And uh, we are joined by our good friend, Bangkok Pat, who you probably saw just a moment ago as he came in. How you doing, man? Good to see you. Uh, sure? That's about our third greeting we've staged for the camera, so I you know, know but, uh, they won't know. <laughs> well, they will now. <laughs> if you're into Thailand's history, you probably know this guy. He goes by Bangkok Pat, and he's a tour guide and a YouTube host who's about as good as it gets when it comes to diving into the stories of this city. So I reached out to Pat and asked if he had time during our 24 hours to stop by for a walk around and to hopefully find out not just when the market was built, but why. still get that you know sensory overload coming to a place like this yeah. even after 20 years here or whatever you've been certainly you know, I, I still do yeah you know, I've been in Asia for what 14 years now and I still get that like you walk in and you're just overwhelmed by the colors and the sights and the sounds and the smells and like yeah to me, it's, yeah it's great it's like the I'm in I'm somewhere amazing you know? yeah it is even if I when I was filming down here last year and when I've come through here showing people around on tours you still come through here and you say to yourself, you're in Bangkok. You know, this is, uh, this is part of the sights and the sounds and, and the culture and how people do stuff. And uh, it's, it's still exciting. I'm constantly being amazed by this city. Toy Market was built on top of a slum in 1957 and before the actual market opened there was still a bit of a market there but there was a few communities that moved on to the, to the land here and they moved them away and built what became Klong Toy Market today. So I think there's a, there's a sign on the building in Thai, it says 1920, it says 25 03, which is 1960. Okay. Mm. Yeah, so all those shop houses, all these uh, are 1957. That was when this sort of, uh, this type of shop house was built, more square sort of design. Yeah. Why was this needed when it was built? Was this a desire to have a bigger on-land market that was no longer on the water? I mean, we're, we're kind of 50 years, 1957. You had the 50 port. years since we started building markets inland mm. in, in Bangkok. You had the port over there, and stuff was coming in. And with the with the stuff coming in through the port, obviously there were local people who thought it would be a good idea to sell sell stuff locally rather than you know big loads of fish coming in and going straight to uh, to hotels or other markets. Um, why not set something up here? And then uh, a lot of smaller restaurants and places can come here. And of course, people can come shopping here. Mm. So, and it just became huge. There used to be a canal that ran from Hong Krakenong all the way down to Hua Long Pong. It's cut off here now, the Klong Hua Long Pong. And that used to go all the way alongside Rama 4. And it's interesting because I'm trying to think of how things would have worked before when they built this 1957. And then they filled that canal in about 1959. But I'm thinking if they didn't fill it in, there would have been, there would have been loads of boats along that canal. Because I've got old pictures of it with loads of boats heading all down Is towards... that the same footprint as Rama Fort? Yeah. Hmm. The canal? Yeah, it went right alongside the canal and then uh, it joined the Krung Kasem Canal at Hua Lung Po. And because they actually opened, there's another, there used to be a wet market in Hua Lung Po at the other end of this canal. So I was, I was thinking, how would that work? 
if there was loads of boats going up and down, were they were they retailers or were they? I mean, they would have been selling stuff. Private citizens, or yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that was nineteen fifty-seven to nineteen sixties. So, but so from the way you're describing it, it sounds like uh, it sounds like this was relatively informal until yeah nineteen sixty. You know, when you see that sign that says the building was built. Yeah. So when this was built in nineteen fifty-seven, it wouldn't have looked like this big no. metropolis of a market. No, this is the second. The, the the second wave of modernization uh, was the fifties. Mm. The the population grew massively. All these shop houses that look like this are ni- uh, uh, nineteen fifty seven to nineteen fifty nine. The, the squarish design, looking a bit ragged, and then in the sixties you had the ones you know with the stripe stripy. Yeah, uh, uh, it's a bit nerdy, but uh, that's my porn, right? By 10 o'clock at night, most of Bangkok's 14 million residents are at home, watching TV, reading a book, or already in bed, getting rested for work the next morning. Tourists and revelers are packing the bar districts of Nana and Khao San Road, throwing down one too many shots and making bad decisions, and here at Klongdoi, well, it's a different world. Its own city within a city transitioning to perhaps the most important time of the day. The turnaround is something incredible. It's not a continuation of the previous day, it's a total reinvention, a rebirth. Entirely new corridors come to life seemingly out of nowhere, while the busiest alleys from just a few minutes ago wait for the cleaners to come scrub the ground and collect the trash. It looks and feels completely different and somehow exponentially more exciting. At nighttime, the day workers after their long shifts have a chance to unwind, to have some street food or shoot a game of pool. Fresh ingredients arrive in an endless parade of trucks and delivery cars, and the customers are no longer the average local. This is now the beginning of the market meant for chefs. If you want to find high-quality Thai ingredients, you can come here anytime. But if you want the rarest produce, the most fascinating seasonal items, and the very freshest meats and seafood, well, this is when you start heading over. And in a city with 179 restaurants in the Michelin Guide, an estimated 320,000 other restaurants and half a million street carts, well, it's a paradise for cooks to browse the stalls and aisles for things most of us might not even know exist. One of those Michelin chefs is Riley Sanders of Bangkok's legendary Canvas. His restaurant has been called one of the most exciting up-and-coming venues on the planet, somewhere between art and cuisine, and whose 22-course tasting menu was, without question, the best fine dining experience I've had in the city. Chef Riley isn't just a fan of the late-night version of Klong Doi Market. He's such a fan that it was actually his idea, all the way back in 2022 when I told him I was going to start a YouTube channel for us to make exactly this video. So, all right, the genesis of the idea of doing this video all together, you know, I have a spreadsheet that I keep at home of ideas for videos and slowly, you know, they come off the board when we get around to it. This is, this is a weird backdrop. <laughs> the chickens are going crazy. Welcome to Klong Doi. Yes. Um, Riley, chef, thank you so much for doing this. This Happy is- Happy to be here. I, I've, now we are a year and a half into the channel and this has been on the list for a year and a half and we're finally doing it tonight. And this is really one of my favorite places in Bangkok. I mean, I, I love this market. I used to come here every single day for five years, the first five years I lived here. And I used to get ingredients from the restaurant and learn about the seasonality. And I don't come here that often anymore, um, but it's, it's good to be back and let's walk around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lead, lead the way.
These are kind of cool over here. This looks like some Celtis. Um, I don't think that I've seen a Declong toy before, so I'm kind of eyeing that over here. I want to pick it up and see what we got. I don't know the Thai name. I need chula. There was one time back when I was around 25 when I found myself in a village in rural China. There was one other American guy staying out there and we met for a beer and I noticed that the bar had a ping pong table. So I asked if he wanted to play. As I grabbed a paddle and got ready to win a couple of games, he reached into his backpack, took out, and I'm not making this up, a gold embroidered ping pong case, brought out his monogrammed paddle and proceeded to beat me so badly the girls in the bar started laughing. It's a feeling that's hard to describe, but it's not that different from walking around Klongdoi Market in the middle of the night with Chef Riley. We're around the same age, we come from similar places, and we're both career chefs. But when it comes to exploring Thailand's obscure ingredients, well, let's be honest, this is his game, and all I can do is try to keep up and hope nobody starts laughing. So, so sour plums? These are jujube. Jujube, yeah. And, um... We use these on a dish with uh, pork belly. What are these? These are mayom is the name. They're sour. Mayom, <laughs> shime. We would call it climbing wattle. Okay. Actually, it's probably the most specific, but it's uh, in the Akasha family. In the Akasha, yeah, 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 sure. What is this? These are Cisbania flowers. Um, <laughs> you say that as if I should be like, oh yeah, Cisbania flowers. All of these ingredients that you find, if you're lucky, you know, in, in, a, in a culture without wet markets, right? If, uh, if we didn't have this, what incentive do farmers have to continue growing these niche ingredients that maybe don't have a mass market? That's a big reason of why we wanted to come here also is we want to find these rare ingredients that are underappreciated and find some uses for them. And if the market wasn't here, I don't know where we'd find them. You know, like I, I'm not sure if they'd have a, a place they could be sold. Even right below you, these are all things that are relatively well known in Thailand, but Somebody watching this overseas probably wouldn't have seen any of these. Yeah. So let's start with this real quick, if you can kind of tell me what, what we're looking at. These guys are white pulpanac seeds, is the name in English. Um, they're a little funky. They're kind of like, uh, kind of like stink bean in a way. Mm -hmm. And occasionally these could be like toasted and the chef was telling me to toast these in, in a pan until they get crispy and they're super aromatic. It's not just the rare ingredients that attracts people like Riley to the market during the overnight hours. There's a soul. Something hard to put into words, but it feels like you're part of an exclusive fraternity. If you know, you know. It's still chaotic, but somehow the community part of the community market seems so much more obvious in the middle of the night. Maybe it's because most customers no longer have to rush to get back to a restaurant or get home to feed the family so they can take their time. Maybe it's the weather cooling down or the festive atmosphere from the people letting loose after a long day, but it's different, that's for sure. There might be a hierarchy when it comes to the workers, but after midnight, that doesn't matter. Whether you're a third generation vendor or a migrant from another country, everyone's the same over a post shift beer or a glass of yadong, the theoretically legal grain spirit that's allegedly medicinal and tastes well, it tastes like what might happen if you distill a gym locker room. Cheers. Cheers. And <laughs> I'm not sure if it's a sip or a chug, oh, but it smells that. Uh... <laughs> yep, that's exactly what it smells like. Yeah. It's not bad. Don't do what I did. That was aggressive.
I stayed in a hostel the first time that I was in Thailand, and this was like super, like you know, five dollars a night or something like that. And I asked the receptionist at the hostel, who was like the owner of it, I was like, "I'm a chef, and I came here for food. Like, I want to learn about Thai food, and I, I need to know. I need to know where to go." And she was like, "Well, the place that you really need to go is t a l a t k l a n g t e i and k l a n g t e i Market, of course." And I said, "Well, where's that?" And she was like, "Well, you got to take a taxi." Like she was trying to explain to me how to go here and all that. This was the first morning, the first time um, that I came to Thailand after I woke up in the morning. I was like, "Where should I go?" And she sent me here, and I came here at like 8 a.m. or something like that. And I walked around, and I was just mesmerized by it. And it, it was definitely the vibrance of it, and the the colors, and all of that. But also. I would look at these ingredients and I would think I would love to cook with these. I would love to do something with this. A market like this is something that's so special and so unique and so interesting that um, I don't think that it will last forever. Like we mentioned, uh, uh, talked about a little bit, of, and it, it makes me feel like um, maybe we're stepping back in time in a way because here we are, 2024, and we have this market that feels like it's been here forever. And these are people, thousands of people that rely on this every single day. Um, I wish that this is something that can continue for centuries, but I, I don't think that that's going to be reality. If this is no longer a reality, what what changes? What do we lose when we lose places like this? For one, I think that we don't have the ingredients that we have now. Like we see these interesting ingredients tonight, and I'm afraid that we're not going to see them anymore. <laughs> um, I wonder what happens to the people that are working in the market, and this is their livelihood, and this is what they um, this is what they do. And where does their jobs go? Is it you know? Is it AI? Is it something automated? Is it you know? Um, It's definitely not like this, and I don't know what the answer is. Like I don't, I can't predict the future, but I know that what we have here is something really unique and special. By two a.m., most of the city is asleep. Even the bars and nightclubs are winding down, but at Klongdoi, the city within a city is buzzing with activity. While some alleys are being cleaned, others are full of vendors and shopkeepers preparing ingredients for the next morning. I mean, this is the origin point of so much of Bangkok's food, which means when you see things for sale that are handmade, well, they were probably made here. This is also the time when a lot of new stock gets delivered. When farmers send their trucks out for delivery for the next morning, and for things that are at a premium in Thailand, especially meat, well, this is rush hour. As Chef Duke told us earlier, when you want to buy beef that doesn't come from a processing plant, supplies are limited, and so in the middle of the night, that's when k l o n g d o i sees a rush to secure the very best stuff. The beef sales here are almost like tuna at Tsukiji. You show up on time, or you miss out. By 9 a.m., the time we arrived and when we're gonna leave, it'll be far too late, and the only viable option would be to buy beef from grocery stores, the kind of places that never run out because they get their stock in frozen from factory farms on the other side of the world. The term "wet market" was coined in Singapore in 1978, a designation by the local government on paper meant to differentiate outdoor farmer centers from modern grocery stores. But the subtle message was clear. It was noted that the name was chosen because the ground is always wet, covered, according to Singaporean authorities, with fish guts, animal waste, and melted ice. Singapore in 1978 was right at the beginning of the economic wave that would propel the island into the 21st century. Today, the per capita income is as much as $80,000 a year, ranking in the world's top five. And there's no place in a rich cosmopolitan country for places like this. I don't know when society turned against the kind of markets that had built and sustained cultures, bonded communities, and made food affordable since the beginning of history. But it happened, 
And soon after the big box stores arrived, these markets were on the chopping block from Europe to right here in Asia. Maybe the death knell came in 1957 when a trade group financed the building of a showpiece called Supermarket USA in communist Yugoslavia, with the modern shelves stocked with boxes of name brand items intended to show a stark contrast with the rival country in the middle of a famine under General Tito. Or maybe it was 1962 at an international expo in Europe when grocery conglomerates built a literal tree out of sausages to display the abundance of their selection. The grocery stores that would feed the planet are massive corporations. In 2023 alone, Carrefour turned over $87 billion in sales. Aldi generated $110 billion, and Kroger topped the list at $150 billion. Unless you include Walmart as a grocery store whose annual revenue was above $600 billion. The companies that rule the world do not like competition, and certainly not competition that sells at lower prices. And when these chains, food suppliers, and importers leaned on cities to crack down, they found a receptive public, ready to accept without question that these places are primitive, dirty, uncivilized, and a news media happy to reinforce that image. I mean, nothing drives ratings like an undercover camera filming some unscrupulous vendor at a wet market, and anyway, the workers and shoppers here are blue collar, working class, even immigrants, and if those people complain, nobody hears it. They're not the ones who get to make decisions. Never mind the fact that some of them might starve if their only choice is to buy food from a supermarket. It's their fault for not working harder in any way. Collateral damage in the march of progress. Somewhere, society got the idea that vegetables are only safe to eat if they come wrapped in a package and sprayed with chemicals. It's wrong, it's backwards, but by now, it's public perception. And of all the voices across the planet joining the chorus to get rid of community markets, the most frustrating are the ones fighting for animal welfare. Taking down these awful wet markets has been a cause of animal rights activists for decades, and for what? If it comes in a nice package and we don't see the carcass, does it not count? Maybe not seeing the actual animal we're buying lets us feel better about ourselves, avoid any feelings of guilt for our own decisions. But will shutting these places down save any lives? No, of course not. All it'll do is speed up the end of small-scale farming and guarantee more and more meat comes from factories. The last hope of any revival of the wet market ended in 2020 with the spread of COVID, with an origin story that's complicated and nuanced, but all anyone saw was the very first headline, wet market. Since then, at least globally, the fight is over. The narrative is set, and it feels like something that for the first time since the pyramids were built is now facing extinction in all but the poorest countries. In China, even before COVID, the government's been pushing for their removal for decades, with the first years of Xi Jinping seeing almost all the ancient wet markets in Beijing bulldozed to showcase what should be a civilized, modern capital. Even Wuhan's Huanan market, where COVID appears to have spread, well, it wasn't really a community market at all. It was actually part of a big conglomerate owned by a listed real estate company. And here in Thailand since 1997, Klongdoi has no longer been the largest fruit and vegetable market in the country, just the biggest one meant for the public. Talad Thai, between Bangkok and Ayutthaya, is a clean and modern enterprise selling 15,000 tons of produce per day, and it long ago replaced Klongdoi as the main supplier to regional towns and domestic grocery stores. In other words, Klongdoi and markets like it aren't necessary anymore, even here but that doesn't mean its loss wouldn't be catastrophic. It's this market, not the economy, that keeps street food prices in Bangkok so famously low. It's this market that keeps traditions alive, keeps small-time farmers in business, and keeps rare ingredients from functional extinction. Anyway, at least I can always say that I had the chance to experience this one for an entire unforgettable 24 hours. You talk about the uh, the city that never sleeps. 
uh, this is certainly the market that doesn't sleep. Like, it's, uh, it's five something, 5.15, 5.30, and it is just like it's, you know, it's rush hour. It's It has not slowed down. I have started to realize, number one, how tired I am, and number two, how badly I smell. I am, I am now, I, what are we, 20 hours in, 19 hours into uh, to our 24 hours here at Bongoy, and I smell like it. I, I might have to burn these clothes before I finally walk into the house. The sun rises fast in Southeast Asia. The first rays of light appeared over the skyscrapers around 6.15, and by 6.20, it was as if we'd dropped back into the middle of the day. Klongdoi Market is a machine, a non-stop powerhouse that just keeps on going, and being here through all of it can be more than disorienting. Time is a flat circle. I don't even know what that means, but in my exhausted and sleep-deprived state, it doesn't even matter. Now is not the time for high-minded theories, it's the time for coffee. And we know where we can find one vendor, exactly where we saw him yesterday, or today, or whenever that was. So a lot of this, a lot of this has been something that is is brand new to me. Uh, first experience having a proper lunch and dinner in the market. First experience having late night food here. Not my first experience having breakfast. In fact, that's something that we filmed on the channel. Uh, rarely do I wake up early enough or stay up late enough to take advantage of one of the best breakfast markets in the entire city. But right across the street, and what Bangkok Pat was telling us off the channel was called. Uh, New Klongdoi Market, Klongdoi Part 2. Right across the street, the breakfast market. Right now, before seven o'clock in the morning, this is probably the best possible time to come here. You can see the energy in the crowds and that is our absolute breakfast destination. We're really excited for what we're gonna find there. This is just so much cooler than I thought it was going to be. Uh, I've never been here, I guess, before 7 o'clock in the morning. And uh, are we still before 7 o'clock in the morning? 6.42. It is like half of these places are going to be sold out before 7. Uh, there's nowhere to sit. We're going to get our usual Kanam Jin because it's the only place here that has tables. But what I wanted to point out as we're walking past is that this is one of my favorite Southern Thai style Khao Gang counters. And I usually come here for my fix of Pad Sa Ta. And I'm looking at this, I'm like, ah, she doesn't have Pad Sata today. And I realized, well, we didn't see Sata beans in the market because it's not in season. And it makes sense that, you know, of course we don't see it here because we don't see it there. And like, you start thinking about how interconnected all this stuff is and how, you know, the ingredients that are fresh are, are what you find there. And if you're not finding it there, then the best restaurants aren't gonna use it because this is where they're doing their shopping, especially here, you know, where we're basically attached to the market. But uh, it's so interesting to start. I, I'm sure if we look for some of the things that we did find, like Riley was pointing out yesterday, the uh, acacia leaves, you know, and when we were walking around with him, and that's something that you see in this very first dish right here, you know, and it's like, what's fresh and what's in season right now? And like, now, if it's there, it's here. And, and I guess that's the rule pretty much for all of Bangkok. Uh, it's about seven o'clock in the morning, uh, breakfast time. We have now seen pretty much every corner of the market. Uh, I would imagine we've seen every corner, but I keep being surprised by, by different things. And uh, yeah, what an evolution, you know? It's come, kind of come full circle where it's starting to look like it did when we first arrived yesterday, but in between we saw two or three complete cycles 
where everything would move and change and new things would come in and customers would change, vendors would change, uh, the entire spirit would change. But the one thing that wouldn't change was it has stayed busy all throughout. Uh, I am just broken. Uh, 24 hour shoot sounded great on paper. It's like, let's see what this market's like for 24 hours. What I didn't anticipate is how I was personally gonna feel and smell after 24 hours in the market. I got a little bit of time left to go, but for now, let's eat uh, their version of the same meal that we started with, with Chef Duke. Mm. There's just such a soul here, this market. Like, it's a, it's a really unique and special place. And you have to look at it in three dimensions. I don't think that I would have understood or appreciated this place without seeing it all at once, you know, without being here and watching how, because we're gonna go home, you know, when this is over, after we finish eating, we're gonna do another walkthrough. We got a little bit of time left to go and then we're gonna go home. But the market continues. You know, this 24 hour nonstop crazy cycle, that doesn't stop just because we leave. You know, if we came back here in the evening, we would see the same thing we saw today. Maybe, I don't know you know, or, or something different. And, and it's just these cycles that continue and continue and continue. The vegetable seller yesterday who told us that she works 365 days a year, you know? There are no breaks. There's no like Sunday we close, everybody rests. It's like, the, this is the market that feeds the city. You know, it, it can't stop because if it stops, Bangkok stops. And uh, yeah, I think that's the, the biggest sort of wild takeaway for me is that when I leave and go home, I'm the only one you know, with Boris, you know, everybody else is still here and they just have another day of all of this and the cycle continues over and over again. And it's just, it's really hard to wrap your mind around. You know, it's just such an intense experience that again, we get to go home, take a shower, decompress, and then start writing and editing this video. But the people who are here who are just setting up for their day or breaking down from, from their overnight, you know, that's just now on to the next day, on to the next day. Where are we sourcing the next stuff from? You know, how do we set up our, 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 our cart tomorrow? You know, and maybe they're over at the pool hall, you know, after their shift. Uh, and a lot of people are probably here right now taking food home to go feed their families. I mean, it's, it's really unbelievable when you think about the scale of how something like this can go on day in and day out, 365 days a year for the last 67 years. It's just, it's just unreal. It's unreal. This has, this is truly my favorite place in Bangkok. And I tell that to people even when they come to the restaurant, they're like, where do you like to go on your day off? And where do you like to go hang out? And I'm not saying to go to the big new mall or to go watch a movie or to go some new bar or something like that. I say my favorite place in Thailand is Khon Khoi. มากินหมายความว่าอากาศมันเย็นใช่ไหมมันดูว่าไอ้นี่จีนแต่ของเราเนี่ยมันหมุนเวียนทุกวันของไปของเก่าเราหมุนเวียนเพราะว่าเรามีลูกค้าประจำมันต้องมีเข้ามาอย่างซูเปอร์มาร์เก็ตเนี่ยหมายความว่าคุณจะขายออกคุณสั่งมา10โลแน่ใจไหมวันหนึ่งคุณจะขายหมด10โลมันไม่ใช่แต่ตลาดนี่ถึงไซส์นี้ไม่หมดแต่ไซส์อื่นมาแทนลูกค้ามันหมุนกันไปคือมันต้องลงทุกวันซูเปอร์มาร์เก็ตไม่ลงทุกวันนะ They'll never go away. It's impossible. You, you can't you can't sanitize this and bring it indoors. It wouldn't be the same. I think people part part of uh, part of coming here is, is the chaos and the, and the smells and the noise and the cats and the dogs and the, the kids running around barefoot. เพื่อร้านอาหารส่วนใหญ่ที่นี่จะมีของขายหมดครบทุกอย่างว่าตลาดใหญ่ปากของตลาดสี่มุมเมืองอะไรอย่างเงี้ยยังมีของไม่เท่ากับของเตยเลยก็ยินดีค่ะยินดีต้อนรับทุกประเทศเลยให้เข้ามาคงเตยแม่ค้าคงเตยยินดีต้อนรับทุกชาติทุกประเทศทุกศาสนายินดีมากๆเลยคนไทยใจดีคนไทยใจดีมารยาทดีน่ารักรักทุกชาติทุกศาสนาเลย2องมือต้อนรับหมดเลย
24 hours in Klong Klong Bay Market. Oh God, I just blinked and my eyes didn't even want to open again. Going to sleep. Subscribe to the channel for more from OTR. Thank you so much to those who support us on Patreon. It really helps to keep us going. Find the links below for our Patreon and social media, and we'll see you soon. Hey, coconut milk next to laundry detergent, next to peanut brittle, next to dish soap, and what looks like a THC-infused chicken bouillon powder. Welcome to Klongdoy.